Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Big Idea. I'm your host, Jason Seymour, and I am so excited to be with you. We have an amazing guest today. So the U.S. Embassy and in Jakarta and the U.S. Mission to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations started this show, The Big Idea, because we know that Southeast Asia is filled, filled with leaders who have big ideas and they should be sharing those big ideas with all of us. And we have one such special leader with us today. I wanna introduce all of you to Nazora Noor. She is an alumna of US government programs. She's a member of the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative and much, much more. Welcome to the program, Nazora. Hi, Jason. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm uh, very excited to be here. I'm um, very honored, actually. Uh, well, I am honored to have you with us, too. So I want to start because I know that you do a lot of programs, training young leaders, tra training women leaders. So when you look out into the world, in your community, in Brunei, your country, uh, what do you, what inspires you? What do you see as the best qualities of a leader? What do I see um, best quality of a leader? Yeah. yeah um, what inspires you in leaders? Political leaders, academic leaders, military leaders? What are the special qualities that make leaders effective? I think their, um, their empathy is, um, I think it's an inspiring trait for me, um, being able to empathize, you know, towards the teammate, uh, the team, and I think also their courage, you know, in courage and also, you know, um, you know, leading people is not easy. I think you you also know this for sure. You know, you're dealing with different people, you know, managing different people and all that, and I feel like. Um, it really takes a lot of experience for you to actually find, you know, that sweet spot of, you know, what kind of a leader you want to be. And, you know, it is inspire, what inspires um, that quality, I, I would say, like the having an empathy, um, you know, believing um, the team uh, and, and yeah, and so on. Sorry, yeah. That's okay. Empathy. We'll add, we'll add on more, yeah, later. <laughs> Empathy is a good one. Yeah. Uh, empathy is important. That's how we understand the needs of other people. And when you're going to lead people, understanding your team, having conversations, being able to learn about their lives and their histories and their needs, all of that is wrapped up in being able to lead those individuals, certainly. Uh, tell the audience a little bit about some of the training programs that you have conducted as a YCLE alumna. Um, so for that, actually, the most recent one will be the one in October last year. Um, it was during the, uh, the pandemic, actually. So because of that, we had to do it some sort of hybrid in a hybrid format. Um, so it's actually called the YCLE Virtual Youth Program on Women's Leadership, where we had about 20 participants from diverse backgrounds, um, ranging from those who were uh, still in university, just freshly grad, fresh grads, um, those who work in the government and also private sector. So for that program, um, it was conducted in, in three weeks long, um, actually, um, and then, uh, we also had some in-person sessions as well. So for the the virtual programs, we've had local and international speakers as well, um, uh, covering topics such as uh, women's leadership in Islam, um, um, women's health, and then understanding uh, the introduction to gender um, and also equality, gender equality. Yeah, and we've had some session on mindfulness as well. And then we had... Um, sharing session by some of the female leaders. We have local female leaders that we have here in Brunei. And for the in-person sessions, we had uh, we actually paid a visit to the um, women's prison, uh, the local women's prison, and also some mentorship programs that we had. Um, so for this program, uh, we actually cu curated it in the, in, with having in mind that 
you know, women's leadership is actually a broad topic. So, you know, there's one, uh, you know, we can see it in the perspective of health, we can see it in the perspective of Islam, and then there's also the mindfulness uh, to it, you know, being a leader in general, mindfulness, uh, you know, it's, I feel like it's an important thing, uh, you know, being mindful is important, especially now with the, uh, with the, pande- the ongoing pandemic that we have, you know, these difficult times and, and we also had uh, the, the mentorship, like I was mentioning earlier, um, we had it in person session because, you know, like mentorship, you know, having a mentor would be great um, in your prof- personal and also pro- professional development. So during the session, we actually um, did, what do you call that, um, one-on-one mentorship where the participants will play mentor-mentee role. And they will. They also had the opportunity to um, meet mentors who are in, you know, various uh, industries. Um, that time we had um, some a uh, couple of people from the military background, and then some from business, and then um, some more health professionals as well. So, um, so yeah. So that's like uh, the program that we had last year um, because we feel like we. It's also important to understand that women's leadership is a broad topic you know um health um, there's like uh, personally speaking as well um during the program you know as an organizer uh, we also participated in all the sessions so there's definitely a lot of things that we learned you know things that we never knew uh you know things that we never knew basically um so yeah that's pretty much uh, the only program uh, that i've organized uh in my uh, Tenorship as the Brunei country lead uh, since last year until this year. And that's just like uh, helping out people for different projects. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it as of today. Yeah, for, under the WLA specifically, women's leadership. Uh, the topic of mentoring and, and mentorship is, is so complex. People often don't realize how complex it is, both in terms of how to find a good mentor because I know from my own life, I've had my share of good mentors and bad mentors, but sometimes it took me a while to figure out the difference between the two. And then also, it's not so easy being a mentor. You have to figure out how to connect with the other person, what information the other person wants. So that's that's great that in your program, people practice both sides being the mentee and the mentor, because there's an art to both sides. Correct, I, yes. I, I'm curious, you, you mentioned that as part of this program, you focused on women uh, women and health. And during the pandemic, there has been so many different discussions about different elements of health. And I'm curious, what, what, have, been, what, what have been some of the key challenges for women during the pandemic uh, that are distinct from the challenges that men have experienced. Challenges women face when the pandemic. Um, it's also like uh, based on from from what I've read as well, and some that has been shared with me. Um, definitely, um, especially now in Brunei, uh, during the second wave, we're actually in under. Uh, partial lockdown where some are still working from home. Uh, some are working from home. Um, some are working for office, but um, some uh, definitely are working from home and, you know, taking care of kids as well. You know, when you're working mm-hmm. at home, um, having that um, sort of like boundaries, uh, what's work and, you know, your work as a mom and your your work, you know, for the, the for, as your job, you know, and that's definitely like one of the key key um, challenges that I've been hearing from some women, uh, my, my friends as well. Um, you know, because sometimes kids, you know, they do want to go to their moms, you know, like, yeah, that um, in terms of working from home and also um, those that I've heard uh, from others as well, um, you know, some are, you know, victim of, um, abuse and sometimes their way of getting away from the abuser is being in the office but you know with the with the pandemic they're they have to be with their abuser at home um, 
So, so yeah, there, there's like um, some of the challenges that, that were shared with me as well and that, um, that I've read about. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much um, it that I could share right now as well. Yeah. That is a very interesting point. And it's also true for children, many of whom uh, suddenly were being schooled at home. And so for children and some wives who had an opportunity to get away from an abusive situation, suddenly that dynamic changed. Moreover, uh, because of the pandemic, people were facing job loss and insecurities and the stress of being sick or, mm -hmm. or having a loved one hospitalized. And some people took that stress out on their loved ones in an abusive way. So there were lots, so, so the domestic abuse component of the pandemic is very, very true. And a lot of women have been struggling with that. And, and hopefully, just a note for our audience, if you're in that situation, I hope you're seeking your mentors or people that you can turn to or mental health specialists to, to help you. I also wanted to pause for a moment because you mentioned another component of the workshop that you designed, and that was the connection between Islam and leadership, specifically Islam and women leaders. And there's been a lot of discussion worldwide about uh, how Islam interprets the rights of women. And for many people in countries where there's a small Muslim population, they might be looking at what has been happening in Afghanistan uh, with the Taliban rule and their perspectives on women's rights. But as we both know, there are more than one and a half billion Muslims in the world. So there are lots of different perspectives, uh, religiously speaking, about women leadership. I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, for that, um, I think referring to the program as well. Um, so the reason why we incorporate that is because um, sometimes we, you know, we do things because that's what we were told and we were raised to, you know, we were raised, you know, with these things being told to us like, oh, women can do this and that. Um, and then they say, oh, Islam says this and that. But sometimes like these things um, are taken uh, out of context. Um, I think one of the things that I learned during the that session, during the program, um, it was topic of a women's leadership in Islam, uh, was that you know some things are actually permissible, and it's not as as how people say it to be. And you know, you can do things with this condition, this and that. It's like it's not like totally no. And like some of the things that were stated as well, um, it was you know doing the time you know when things were different but now we know with the progress you know with the technology and the, the modern life that we're living in you know things have changed um and uh yeah i wanted to share that um one of the things that i find really found really interesting that time was um apparently in one of the wars back in you know uh during the prophet muhammad's time was that um one of the female warrior one of the warriors who defended the prophet was actually a female um, so I think it, it really um, speaks a lot, you know, um, people say women can this and that, but on what basis actually, where exactly, you know, are you saying it because, you know, it supports uh, what your, you know, whatever your agenda is. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think in my uh, perspective on that is that, you know, we are able to do this, uh, you know, things as long as it, it's not against the religion. Um, like you said, there's definitely a lot of perspective on it. Um, but you know, myself as a Muslim as well, I'm I have been able to do a lot of like uh, taking. I have I've been able to take uh, quite a number of leadership role. You know, my religion didn't stop me from doing that. Um, as long as it's you know it's not haram or like against what what it is. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And so. If someone were to tell you, well, the Quran or the Hadith tells a woman that her only role in society is in the home, uh, having and raising children, uh, what would what would you tell what would you tell them? I think it you know, it's also the women's choice as well. 
if they choose to stay or if they choose to work because at the end of the day you know when they're working she's also supporting the family so you can get like two incomes as well you know to you know for for your for your living and but you know surprisingly there are still some people who think so you know that hey, hey you know a, a woman themselves you know saying oh no i want to be at home because you know women are supposed to stay at home but sometimes you know it's also good to consider you know um why you know why the wise you know am i doing this because of what pers this person said or am i doing this because of my own own will as well so i feel like um you know, it comes down to the individual's decision as well. Um, you know, you you can educate yourself, but sometimes they st still to choose to do and uh, to do so, and it's not wrong. You know, um, as long as it's your own choice. Uh, I mean, that's my take on it. individual freedom, the, right. the the space to make our own choices about our destiny and our lives. Absolutely agree with you on that. Now, I'm going to ask the audience to excuse me for a moment. I'm having a hard time seeing a comment here because we do have a comment. And I just wanted to remind our audience that we welcome your contributions to the chat room and we welcome your questions. And I, we love receiving questions from the audience. So we have received a question from Abimanyu Kasuma, who wants to know about, uh, you mentioned the Women's Leadership Academy, and this gentleman wants to know, how does one apply to be a part of the Women's Leadership Academy? And you know all about that process, so please share that with the audience. So usually for the Women's Leadership Academy, they will um, organize it annually. Uh, I think starting last year, they did it virtually because of the pandemic. So otherwise you would have been in, um, one of the ASEAN countries, basically, for my time back in 2019, I was held in Jakarta. Um, so for that, um, they usually open the application um, and they organize it annually. So I, I think I, I would want to suggest, uh, sorry, I didn't get his name earlier, um, but I think I would suggest to subscribe to the YCLE newsletter. Uh, usually they would um, send out emails when the application is open and they'll give you ample time definitely to prepare uh, for the submission on that. Um, I think I just want to plug in as well. Um, perhaps you could also follow Ysili underscore official on um, Instagram. Uh, check them out on Facebook as well. They're quite active in sharing opportunities, not just on AA, but also other opportunities that, that might interest you. And you can also check out US Mission to ASEAN and the Ysili women um, on Instagram. And they're also on Facebook. Um, I But my answer to that would be the best one would be uh, check out on their social media and subscribe to the newsletter. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Please join the YCLE network uh, as well as our US ASEAN mission social media platforms. And we regularly provide that information. And this is a program that is open for uh, adolescents, uh, young women in their 20s and 30s. So please, please look out for this opportunity and we'll be advertising for next year's program very, very soon. Now you, Nazora, are very passionate about expanding opportunities for women. And prior to the show, you were telling me something very interesting about how you were involved with recruitment for the Bernayan military. So please expand on that for our audience. Um, I'm, actually, earlier this year, I applied for the military officer cadet school. Um, so it was a lengthy process, to be honest with you. Um, it's really competitive as well. So for you to be a military officer in Brunei is you have to go through the selection process where you will undergo se several stages you know it, it ranges from uh, sitting for the English test the fitness test um, uh, psychology test and then four days long of uh, AFCB um, the Armed Forces Commissioning Board uh, where they will test your leadership skills your presentation skills how you're able to command how you're able to, you know, um, to see your performance in interview, in a discussion and lecture as well. So honestly speaking, it has been a great experience. Um, 
it, it was a lot of preparation to be honest uh, it wasn't easy it's really not as easy it, it really is not easy as what people said um but uh, alhamdulillah for that um i actually passed all the stages and inshallah uh, if god's willing i will start the one year training um next year um before i actually uh, become an officer so pretty much excited what the military uh, has to offer you know the opportunities definitely uh, you know personally and professionally speaking it offers a lot of different opportunities and really um looking forward to explore the women's leadership women's leadership uh, side of things in the military because you know as you know when you talk about military um when you hear the word military you know i myself you know men comes to mind it's such a male dominated um career so but we definitely have uh, amazing um great uh, female um uh women in the in the military you know i've even um seen the awardees uh, during this training are actually women you know um you know competing with men yet you know like women are still able to be awarded you know like best academic example uh, best fitness and all that so yeah that's pretty much um, uh, the news um so we'll be off for about a year next year wouldn't be as active in the community uh, which is also why i was a bit um not as active this year as well as i'm preparing for that and actually also just a a day job a couple of months ago so so yeah pretty much excited for for that so pray for me what what motivated you to pursue that position um to be a, a military officer actually i've always wanted to be one but it took me a while to actually apply because you know again you know when you hear people say oh the military is this and that but then like once you actually go through it you know it's not really that bad you know as people said and once you try it and then you see oh you know um and then as you go along and you'll be like okay yes this is it yeah this is what mm -hmm. I, I want to do like the career um but yeah it, it has always been something that i wanted to do but it just it took me this long um, um to finally apply for it so we have a comment which is related it's from uh kairanisa uh, Shari, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, uh, who is mentioning that a lot of women, perhaps they have drive, perhaps they have motivation, but they know that there are some social norms standing in their way, Perception, perceptions of what uh, teenage and adult women can do. How should we, what should we all say? What should we do to inspire these young women to pursue their dreams? I think um, female presentation helps as well. Um, when you see female present representation, you know, you know, when you see like someone, for instance, um, actually, uh, Kairunisa Ashari is our youngest um, female uh, member of the parliament appointed. She actually went for the session with you. Um, I guess, you know, when you see women like her in such a position you, you would you know when you see female presentation like that it makes you think oh you know it is possible you know um these things are possible and then it it's sort of like it could also instill you know <laughs> that drive or inspiration that you know other if other women can do it and perhaps i could do it too so it's just a matter of trying as well and also um i realize you know sometimes with the youth um you know with people i guess individual in general they have it in them but it's just a matter of like you know that that yeah that you know sometimes you just need to show them like oh hey you know you have this and that you could actually do this, this and that um you know that's what i realized you know from these programs you know sometimes they don't realize that you know they're capable of so many things you know it, it sometimes it takes them a conversation sometimes it takes a program to make them realize oh i actually have all these skills capabilities so for for women i guess um it's the representation really helps and definitely programs like women this women's literature program um uh, girl uh, programs uh, targeting girls and women are would definitely be helpful 
Absolutely. Kyrenisha uh, certainly inspired me during my interview with her. And we'll include a link to that interview <laughs> as well. So I hope our audience checks out uh, that, that chat as well. So you were talking about representation and I, I'm interpreting it also that young girls and women need role models, other women who have led the way. Uh, do you have any uh, role models who inspire you, either American or Southeast Asian people we should know about? Um, honestly speaking, it would be my dad, my, my late father, actually. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> sorry. Um, but yeah, I think sorry, I, I didn't expect this, but um, um, <clears throat> I think <gro> <clears throat> um, sorry, let me just like <laughs> get a water break. Yeah, take, take, take your time. Take your time. Clearly, your father meant very much to you. Um, so yeah, um, growing up, actually, my my late father have always been supportive of the things that I do, and then with him as well, you know, with the things that he do, the things that he was very passionate about. Um, um, it, it really, you know, um, really inspired me, his kindness and empathy as well towards uh, his team. Um, uh, back then, you know, during his time, he was involved in quite a, a number of uh, sports organization as well on top of, of his day job. So he was a really busy man back then uh, growing up. Um, he was always away for work. But despite that, you know, I was able to witness as well when he was home um, from this work trips, um, his passion, you know, being on the phone, you know, talking about work and then seeing him work at, uh, hard at work and then setting up for what he believes in, you know, um, fighting for his people. Um, and, um, and he was always supportive as well. I remember like growing up when I was in school, I would look up at the, at the notice board, you know, looking for opportunities, um, any any opportunities to be honest, like camps, English contests, whatever contests, you know, um, I think I shared with you as well. I'm very passionately curious. So I'm truly grateful, you know, to have uh, such a supportive, you know, family, parents, my dad as well, who have been supporting me on that, you know, with my choices as well. Um, but yeah, so going back to um, always looking at this, which is finding opportunities. And then I would go home and then tell him, oh, hey, dad, you know, there's this opportunity. It costs this and that. And he would just give me money. And then I would apply for the program. So, you know, growing up, I realized that, you know, he may not say things that, you know, I'm so proud of you and all that, but he was always there, like um, supporting in his own ways, um, showing up. You know, I guess I, what I realized, I think my family, you know, our love language is... Um, um, act of service, you know, we don't really say things, but, you know, we're just there. Um, but I guess really, you know, that really inspires me, you know, as a parent, being supportive of your kids is really important um, with their choices, you know, letting them have the freedom, what you want to do. But of course, you know, there were also instances where he didn't allow me to do things, but yet, you know, I still like went for it because for me, at the end of the day, you know, if you're out to volunteer, helping out people, doing for good, I don't see anything wrong with that and that you know with good deeds as well god will always is is it for you and uh yeah and you know that you know that quality that his quality of you know being supportive wherever he can in the, in any means that he can um despite you know not always being here as well um and also his empathy his kindness you know i've had like a couple of people when they found out i was his daughter and then they'll be like oh you know your father you know there was this one time i was applying for promotion he believes in me and then you know this is like a story from three decades ago and this person still remembered so these are like the qualities that i really you know i really you know really inspires me how kindness empathy really really goes a long way you know we're talking about three decades uh, old uh, story and this person came up to me telling me that story so I really you know look up to him you know he he was there he showed up whenever he can 
um, you know, his empathy, his kindness towards people, helping out people, um, and, you know, his passion towards the thing that he was advocating for, you know, for sports uh, back then. Um, but, but yeah, so to answer your question, yeah, it's my dad, um, my, 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 yeah, person I really look up to, my late father, actually, yeah. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm very sad that he's not still around because I'd like to meet him because he, the way you describe him, he sounds like a really amazing person. You just received such an outpouring of love from our audience with many virtual hugs and, and people just offering you so much support for uh, bearing your soul with us and your love for your father. And it's so interesting because I, uh, part of me was expecting you to mention a female role model, but you, you mentioned your father and that's such a important reminder for fathers and brothers uh, that uh, we set examples for the girls and women in our life as well. And part of advancing women's rights and opportunities for women is we as men need to be part of this, uh, part of this picture as well, part of this, part of the solution as well, as your father was, who opened doors for you. Sounds like sometimes he would try to be protective, maybe a little too protective, but that that comes from you know how fathers can be. <laughs> and that's parental love, right? <laughs> and your job as the child was to to push a little bit, but for a good reason, because you wanted to make an impact in the right. in the community. Um, so wow, what a what a moving story! And you mentioned empathy at the beginning of the interview, as well as uh, just now, and I can see. Uh, the, the inspiration for that empathy, uh, you know, it came from your parents, it came from your family, and, and, and they showed you the way. And that empathy has pushed you to do so much for the community. So when you're, ha when you're having a, a, a bad day or a rough day, uh, what techniques do you use to keep going and to push forward and not be overwhelmed by by uh, the weight of the problems of the world. What, what are your techniques? <laughs> um, I think yoga really helps um, for me. I just started yoga a couple of years ago as well. Um, it helps me ground it, um, you know, being present, especially in a, such a fast paced world that we live in. Um, yoga really helped me with that. When I started yoga, you know, it took me a while to, pace myself down, you know, you know, to not rush things. Um, and I think talking to people as well really helps um, to, you know, sometimes you just need to talk it out as well. And being mindful, I guess, yeah, um, really helps. Um, yeah, so, I, I, you know, yoga, um, making time for yourself. Sometimes you just need to be away from people as well. Because, you know, being around people can be draining mm. or like it can energize you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes you just need to be on your own just to figure things out. You know, just give your time, yourself a breather as well. Because sometimes when you're always, you know, with people like you don't really have time for yourself to, you know, to process things as well. Um, and going to the question, uh, you said, how do I cope with things? And I think it's also a lot of introspection as well. Um you know, confronting what I'm feeling, you know, why am I feeling this way? What is it? You know, things like that. Yeah. So sitting with the thoughts and confronting them, making peace with them. Um, yeah, because sometimes, you know, you just have to go through these things to, you know, you know, that that phrase, um, go, go through it, grow through it. So, you know, sometimes just part of the growth you know, you have to go through these things. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I love your point that leaders are givers. Leaders really are givers. We're constantly interacting with other people and we're trying to give them tips, give them insights. But we, we, we shouldn't forget that occasionally we need to take some time for ourselves and either do yoga or exercise or find some, some way to refresh ourselves. 
Well, we, do. we don't have a lot more time and we have so many questions from the audience, but I do want to, I want to give you the opportunity to tell our audience a little bit about Brunei. Uh, many of our audience members are from Southeast Asia or America, and they may not know much about uh, Brunei and um, the, the culture of Brunei, the geography of the Brunei, how women are treated in Brunei. So please just share with our audience a little bit about your country, uh, your home. Um, so yeah, Brunei. Um, so we are on the island of Borneo. Um, we have less than half a million population here, uh, quite a small country. Um, and speaking of women earlier, you mentioned about women, we actually have uh, equal access to education and healthcare here in Brunei. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, we, we have, um, they say free education and healthcare, but, uh, you do actually pay a minimal amount. Um, but, but yeah, so you have, uh, and also education is mandatory as well for people age three or four, if not mistaken. So, and we also learn, I think this is like one of the common questions that I get when I meet um, people from outside Brunei. They, they would ask me, oh, so um, do, do you learn English or like what's the language, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, we use Bahasa Melayu here, the language here in Brunei. Um, but we also learn English in school um, from primary school up to university level. So, and some of the mediums that you uh, that we use are are in English. And um, um, you know, Brunei is an amazing country. If you have the opportunity to come here, and I would strongly suggest you to do so. And you know, you'll 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 see what I mean um, in terms of culture as well. Um, yeah, we really have a lot to offer. Um, you know, I think we're about 70% um, covered by rainforest. So really have that um, different experience. I think, uh, uh, you know, some countries, they don't really have that. Um, but yeah, so come to Brunei um, and then you'll, you won't regret it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and if you were to visit me in the United States, what would be a city that you would want to visit? New York. New York. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there so no, the song, Yeah, as the song goes like New York, New York, you know, my friend. Yeah, sure, beautiful city. Well, I, I certainly hope I get to travel to Brunei. What's a special place that you would recommend I, I see as a as as a tourist in Brunei? Um Definitely a lot, but I would suggest you to go to the Tumburung district and spend a night there. Um, and you'll get ex to explore, you know, the the wildlife there, um, the flora and fauna. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think definitely um, Tumburung district. I would highly recommend you. Fantastic. Well, we're just about at the end of the interview. Unfortunately, oh, I've had such a wonderful time talking to you and hearing about your advice for women and leaders and about role models and parenting and, and Women's Leadership Academy and everything that uh, you're involved in and, and how passionate you are, how empathetic you are to future leaders of Brunei and Southeast Asia and the world. And as we have to wrap up, would you like to say a, a closing message uh, to our audience, uh, either in English or your native language? Um, I think this is something that I've been telling myself a lot, uh, especially during this pandemic as well, um, is to be kind to others, but also kinder to yourself. Um, and then be forgiving of yourself as well, um, you know, for the things that you didn't know. And, you know, just to be forgiving of yourself and then to believe in yourself, uh, to be brave and courageous, you know, um, take that leap of faith, um, go out of your comfort zone, explore. Um, and, you know, it, sometimes you just have to trust the process as well. Um, to let let go and let God 
uh, another um, phrase that I I love as well. Uh, but I think um, with you know, with the current pandemic that we're in a difficult time, definitely is to be kind to others and kinder to yourself and be forgiving of yourself. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. <laughs> Excellent advice. Thank you so much. Thanks to our audience for joining us. Now let's all be inspired by Nazora and let's go out and be more courageous and make a difference in our communities. Thanks so much for joining us. Apologies, we couldn't get to all the questions. There were so many, but thank you so much for joining us. And until the next time, take care, everyone.